I'm Roger. I, uh, I'm an organic farmer from Carmarthenshire in Wales and I spend most of my week in London uh, doing a PhD. I've um, got a posh title which basically means I'm basically studying how to make trouble effectively. Um, um, yeah, and I was just going to say I'm really excited and quite sort of nervous because I've done loads of talks over the 30 years of organising and usually I'm pretty relaxed because not much is at stake while what's at stake here is just doesn't bear thinking about um, and so I've really worried about fucking it up <laughs> and then I'm going, well he was a bit of flat um, <laughs> and then, you know what I mean, so because uh, <laughs> I've had, to be honest, I've loads of time to, to organise what I'm going to say and I'm very aware that it's just me and various other sort of problems which could, 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 could come up. But what I'm hoping to do is, is to fast track you, literally, through uh, 30 years of learning on how to effectively organise people. Um, and, and the first lesson about how to organise people is don't tell them what to do, get them to discover what to do. There's always like this really bad tension that I can just sit here, stand here and say this is the way it is and I can more or less guarantee that you're not really going to take it in. You're going to take, people take things in. This is the first major lesson guys. The first lesson of actually organising is to get people to embody the organising themselves. So by, by embodiment it sounds a posh word, but basically that means the act of speech. If someone actually speaks then they start to believe what they're saying, not the other way around. So what we're going to do, the first thing, which might sound a little bit weird, is I'm going to ramble on for a fairly short amount of time, and then you are going to tell each other what I've said. Okay? And then you, you can split up into pairs, and you're going to say, okay, that guy Roger said that, and then you're going to say what you think about it. You might think, well, that's not quite right, and you know, I've got a better idea. Cool. God, it's probably not quite right. Uh, and, and so we're going to have what's called a collective intelligence. That means that basically I know about 20% of what's important in this room. The other 80% is all of you guys. So we're going to try and put it together. Okay? So you're going to experiment with something I've been meaning to do for a, a while. So I'm just going to do it. It might not work properly. But if, if you're in a, a, a right, uh, an Extinction Rebellion meeting online, you basically take a minute to real time, which is so fantastic. You don't even know you're being involved in organising. It's a bit like you do something and then you wait for like five days for a minute to come through and you can't remember. So, <clears throat> the great thing about Extinction Rebellion online meetings is it's almost like tidying the minutes straight away and you can sort of see and you have action <coughs> points. That's another little sort of tip. Uh, so, what, what I'd like to do is, and ho hopefully you're all confident people, is I'm hoping there's some people with laptops. If you've got a laptop, it's a good idea to get it out. And I want one person basically to write up how to effectively organise in Extinction Rebellion. So, we're going to create a document today. And not only are we going to create a document, we're going to video it. Because videoing is where it's at. So we're going to put it on YouTube. So hundreds of people around the world are going to watch it and go, boomph. Okay? <laughs> because we've got to go, boomph. But in the next few months, we're going to take down all the world government as fast as we can. So it's quite a big, big aim. It's perfectly possible what I'm going to just try and describe. And there's a big part of it. It's getting the information out there. Okay? So... Um, you don't need to write a little bit down, but you can. But with, with, um, I'm just going to give an introduction, and then, and then you can talk to each other a little bit, and then we'll, we'll, we'll crack on. Okay, so that's the co-creation side of it. Yeah, I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, in, uh, in the first bit. Um, yeah. So to summarise, basically, this is number one principle: good enough. Okay, what we're going to try and create is something that's good enough, like central principle of effective organising. Okay, because one of the biggest problems with people getting things together is people that say that's not good enough, and then two weeks later it's still not good enough. You see what I mean? So what we're, what we're trying to create here is pretty crappy, but it's going to be good enough because we've got an emergency. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is do this like mad rush around various literature, 
okay? And one of the, hopefully one of the benefits of doing this today, we're not going to spend ages on it, is we're going to be touching all the bases, right? Because you can go on loads of courses, and there's no doubt some of you have, you find that fantastic sort of description of how to, you know, transform politics. But it's not going to tell you the answers about how to deal with feeling depressed, right? Which is a major problem in organising. So we're going to talk about depression. We're also going to talk about critical theory. We're also going to talk about entrepreneurial theory. We're also going to talk about sales, right? We're going to basically raise all the rules of literature. You know, but a lot of them are like off limits, but we don't care because we just need to know how to be effective, these sort of things. So that's why I'm a bit of a maverick because I bring in these different things. And people say, oh, yeah, look at that. So that's not, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't give a shit, right? Like, if, if that's how, you know, if, you, if, if there's a good way of selling perfume to women in America, I want to know about it because that's how to get people to do things, right? So there's this thing in complexity theory called extraction. And that means that you take a way of doing things from one sphere and completely take it over to another sphere. And, and the, Proposition in, that's how major change happens. Okay, you go to the opposition and you nick a major right, a major way of doing things, and you translate it into your particular sphere. Um, so it's not we're not talking about evolution here, right? It's not like we're gradually spending the next five years becoming effective organizers and going, fuck, that's good, let's nick it. Okay? Alright. So um, Boom, 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 boom. Right, so we're going to do personal stuff, and then we're going to go on to group stuff, and then we're going to go to mass organising. We're going to go like that. Okay? Um, so, two fi final little points in this section. Okay? So, I think, like, in all of our minds, I'm sure we sort of know this, but we need to reiterate it about every 10 minutes, that there's a UN report which says we've got 12 years to transform the world economy. We've got to reduce carbon emissions by 40%. Okay, so good luck with those governments because you're just not going to do it. So we're all here today because we know these governments aren't going to do it. We've got to take them down, transform them, and it's going to be the biggest like, adventure in humanity. Okay? <laughs> One way or another. We're going to go down fighting or we're going to achieve it. Right? So it's just like the worst of times to live and it's the best of times to live. And you can between those two, I'm sure everyone does. Okay, so the last point is, without sounding overly embarrassing, is you might think, oh, like Roger Hallam, you've got all the answers, he's great. Well, I'm going to jail next week, I might be going to jail for quite a long time. So I'm out of the system, so this is it. It's like farewell, <laughs> farewell <laughs> communication to you people. <laughs> it's all over to you. And there's a big thing in the literature that says, like, the best way of, of teaching people is you tell them the deal and then you fuck off out of the room. Literally, go <laughs> out of the room. Because if they're in the room, subliminally, they're thinking, oh, well, I thought we've got to think about that. Maybe I should call him over. In other words, people don't think for themselves. So I'm going to tell you this collective wisdom of 30 years of organising. Half is going to be crap. You're going to change it around something. Next week, I'll be in Crown Court. I'll be saying to the judge, go away. He'll get the sound. I want to talk to the jury about climate change. So, there we go. <laughs> so, first little breakout, turn to the person next to you and talk about whatever you want to talk about. This is another little technique. Okay? For about two or three minutes. Where you're at. Yeah. What you're doing. Yeah. Minute chats, three or four minute chats. I think that's enough for the live to just chat and know. Um, Right, so the first thing we're going to do, do you want me to cover yeah. that over? <laughs> it's a little bit, I don't want to be looking like I'm doing a torture test thing. Uh, that one, yeah. Can we leave one off? Yes, yeah, this one. Yeah. Is that that one? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the really yeah. 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 Look really happy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to split people into half. So the first thing we're going to do is look about look at personal resilience. Okay? So the general idea and, and personal organization. It's two sides of the personal side of things. So personal resilience is you, you become an organizer, you get depressed, you get stressed, 
You don't know what's going on. You burn out. Okay, the usual trajectory. Okay. And then the other side of the equation is you become an organiser, it's chaotic, you don't know what you're doing, it's a mess, you're not very good, so you give up. All right? So those are the two problems that most people do, and 90% of people, two years later, they're not doing what I do because of these two things, that's set it for the sake of argument. So where do we split to two? Is there, were you two together? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you guys talk to the person next to you, and you've got to come up from your personal experience of, of one thing, let's say, one thing which in your personal experience stops you getting depressed, anxious, stressed, etc., burning out. What do you do? Is it something you do? So it's, we're talking about actions, okay? Uh, so I'm going to give you about a minute or so to come up with your best bet, good enough solution to that problem. Um, and then remember it, I'm going to do that first and then we'll do like personal organisation. So if you guys want you to come up with your best bet, how do you actually organise yourself? So you get up in the morning and you're going to become an effective organiser, what does that mean? One or two things that actually make it work for you. Okay? You've only got two minutes. Okay? Remain emotionally resilient. So I'm going to write one or two ideas up. Um, and someone's going to take minutes, as it were, they're going to write up the supreme document of, of, of physical organising. So who's going to do that, Sat? Yeah? Great. Okay. You can say their name before I talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the idea is, the idea, you don't need to be, it's a generic do document, so you don't need to put people's names, just um, the question is, emotional resilience, this is how you do it. Two paragraphs, and then we'll put a reference on. So, do two of you want to volunteer an idea or two? Sorry, yeah, go on. I was going to ask you, do you want someone to describe the whiteboard? Um, I'm just going to use this, if that's all right. Yeah. Uh, so, one or two ideas. Um, not. Um, I would have said, re like, retreat to nature, just to get a perspective on why we're doing this, and to give yourself some time to think, and take a back step, and breathe. <laughs> the mountains or woods, we'll see. Yeah, for me it's um, about calendar. Um, Sorry? Mine is calendar. Uh, yeah. Grounding. Um, get, get in your body. Um, whatever that is for you to do, to kind of tune in and uh, be, be, be present with yeah. yourself. One other? Chubsan? <laughs> what? Cook. Cook. Cooking. Cooking. Yeah. Yes. Washing yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you one or two things that can make me a bit more generic. And again, you know, this isn't a definitive situation, right? But I think one little bit of a fear around it, fear, a theory around it, is that is that one of the reasons people get get depressed and anxious is because they tell themselves a story about their situation, and the story is it's going badly and they're bad, and we hold up that internal voice. So one of the things that social science sort of discovered, as it were from various different, different disciplines is that you aren't who you are. So one way of looking at that is phenomenology. Right? <laughs> phenomenology. Yeah. So that's the idea that you experience the world and you, you don't experience the world as it is. We've got this like materialistic culture where you know, we think that's a chair, but it's not, right? It's, sort of, it's what you perceive, if you see what I mean. This, it takes a little bit to get your head around, but once you sort of get it, it's enormously liberating because you realise that that the world is not the world. The world is what you're perceiving, and by education you have some freedom to reinterpret the world and also your own emotions, as it were. So the big sort of development in our society at the moment is mindfulness, and my understanding of that is is developing a way in which you can watch yourself freaking out. <laughs> okay, so you're not freaking out, you're watching yourself freaking out and 
to the extent that you can watch yourself freaking out, the freaking out starts to subside because it's not you anymore. Now obviously sometimes you're going to be freaking out and freaking out because you're freaking out and you can't get your head around it. But at a certain point, most people most of the time, if they, if they develop this mindfulness muscle, you, got, got, you can start thinking, fuck, I'm freaking out, and then you can manage yourself. So you can say, right, I'm freaking out, I'm going to go and do the cooking. Because you, do, you, do you know what I mean? So you start, you start treating yourself as some, another person. And, and that's the key thing. It's not going to work all the time, of course, but like, that's one of the things that you might want to look at. So, um, and that connects, this is probably the big, what you have done. Oh, I was going to say that connects nicely to something we were discussing, which was that we each had very different ways of how we kind of brought ourselves up from a low place. Yeah. But the key thing was, you put quite nicely, like developing our reflex, so that the second you start to feel that, you watch yourself freak out. You instantly react in a way that's helpful to you. Yeah. Whatever that might be. So you might want to make a list of what you do when you freak out, stroke your chest, stroke this stuff. Okay. I have an action plan. Then, but you know, so for some people, it's something brilliant, it's cooking, whatever. Mm -hmm. so that's the general idea, idea behind it, and that connects with a deeper idea of transcendence, which is the holy grail of our life. Okay. <laughs> so the general idea here is is that the point of life is not to get on and accumulate things. The idea of life is to have mastery. To have mastery means to be able to transcend whatever you're feeling and to act. Loads of different cultures and disciplines and philosophies which use this sort of general point. So you know you might want to choose a particular particular orientation. Um, and I'm not they always need to tell you which one you should have. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about my personal development because like I was an organizer since I was 15 and I had this bright idea that I was going to change the world and everyone had to fucking get into place and do it with me and for about seven years I was like beating against you know beating away basically internally going why has that person done that and that person should have done that and they've left and you know it's not happening and I might like, have just an emotional chaos until I was about 21 and then I had this big epiphany which is it's not about what people do it's about what I am going to do with my life. You see what I mean? So from then on, if someone hadn't done the washing up, I went and did the washing up rather than freaking out <coughs> on some sort of anarchist theory that everyone should be doing the washing up. If you're in a communal house, the first thing that's gonna burn you out is thinking that fuck has not done the washing up again. <laughs> so, so I just resolved. I just resolved that if the washing up wasn't done, I'd just do it myself. Okay? So there's a big story here about why people burn out because they get over enthusiastic on the justice front. Okay? The world isn't actually that just. And if you want to change the world, it's about maintaining a service orientation. You know, at the end of the day, I'm going to be doing this campaign. If all you guys leave, a little bit of money goes going to go fuckers. But most of me is going to go, that's the way it is. It's the way the world is. I'm just going to march forward and do my stuff. Um, so, I, for instance, like when I did hunger strike at King's College, I said to myself beforehand, I said, Roger, if no one gives a shit, it doesn't matter. It's between me and the cosmos. You know, so I'm straight off there, tell them at King's College, I'm going to go on a fortnight hunger strike to get them to the best. And anything addition is a bonus. You can see what I mean. So obviously I'm not that enlightened, right? But I sort of kept like banging myself on the head to do that. So for instance, like sitting outside, outside King's College and all these students were passing by, you know, not giving a shit. I've got my little sign saying, day 12 of the hunger strike. And they were just walking by. And part of my ego is going, you know, 
his bloody students, you know, they're going to shit out of him and damn it, they die, you know. He's getting into a whole run in my head. And then part of my head was going, Roger, that's not what you're doing it for, do you see what I mean? So, so the next time, you know, having the kid, ten people say they're going to turn up and two people show up. Like, if you want to do 20, 30 years of organising, you have to get in that headspace, because otherwise within two years you burn yourself up with self-righteousness. Um, okay. So the little book to read on this one is, I'm just going to give you a book in each one, is The Power of Now. So, oh, right, yeah. some people might have read it, I love this book. And it's like, Phew. but she's basically saying, all we have, maybe I've got this wrong, right? It's a while since I read it. But my understanding <laughs> of it is, is all we have, all we really have in the universe is this moment now, sitting in this room. Because the past is gone, and the future hasn't arrived yet. And all we have is this single act of consciousness. Uh, that's quite freaky, isn't it? You know what I mean? You haven't got a house, you haven't got your parents, you know, all these things, they're just constructions. All we really have is this moment. And of course, this moment is the most marvellous thing in the universe, you know, because it's consciousness. It's just so, so there, there we go. That's about as deep as I'm going to get. It's all going to get really materialistic <laughs> now. Um, so, that's the deal on that one. So, coming on to a bit more, bit more uh, sort of management here, we're going to do like how you personally organise yourself. So, give me one or two ideas from your group. Uh, lists is my Bible. Lists. Yes. Oh, you just nicked my main point. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I don't really like that girl. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I was really, I'm really scared someone will come up with something that is completely off. Something organising, because I noticed this quite a lot of people taking notes on their laptops. If you don't have the Wi Fi, it makes it slightly easier, but you don't all have to do it. Yeah, so what's happening? is that someone's taking notes, a bit like minutes, and as I said, at the end of the session, we will have the short guide to being just a fucking great organiser. I hope you're going to call that. It's where it's useful to get attention. I have to leave 12 though, so someone else is going to have to do it, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll do that in real time. We're trying to do stuff in real time. Exactly, yeah, good. Hey, so another idea. Focus on where you're going, where you're making this. Sorry? Focus on where you're going, the direction in which you're going. Yeah. Okay. That's what it's all right. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's doing, the, doing the stuff as well. You can't work for not necessarily do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're focusing on it to start with, you focus on yeah. what you're doing, yeah. then you look at your list, and you take a focus, you look at your list, and you see what you think of things. Yeah. I find that if I do that, then I end up with a lot of little bits floating around my head that are saying, give me attention, but they're staying in my head because I haven't written them down. So I make different lists. Mm. Like, <laughs> 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 it's just a list of the things that you should have today, and there's a general list of things. Mm. And some, a lot of them are just things that I'm never actually going to get around to. If you have a climate yeah. crisis, you have a list that is very short because you focus on the things that are really desperate, and the little things that aren't that important will disappear from the wall. That's what you try to do. Mm. Yeah. Do you then have a list for your list? That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a list yeah. queen. Wouldn't I get to clean my upstairs windows this year? It's on the list, man. Yeah, yeah. Eisenhower matrix. Has anyone heard of that? That's what I've used for the last year, which has really helped me to organise it. It's really simple. Split a page into four. You have four boxes: important and urgent, important and not urgent, mm. urgent but not important, <laughs> and not important and not urgent. Yeah. And those ones you get rid of them. They don't need to be done. The important and urgent ones, the important and urgent ones you do now. The important but not urgent ones they can wait. The urgent but not important ones they've got to be done now, but you don't need to do them perfectly. Probably delegate them to someone else and get them done right now. Um, and then, of course, you get to not important and not urgent. So, why are you doing it? So, get rid of it. 
I have a list on my phone at all times, and it's really helped me to prioritise. How do you decide what's important and what isn't important? That comes back to your goals. Yeah. 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 So you don't really get your goal, but ah, so okay, it's, yeah. it's like in a book. If you were in a capitalist society, you don't think it, okay? Yeah. You're just accumulating things. You're not saying, well, hang on, why am I doing this? And once you go back to thinking why I'm doing something, <coughs> then you realise that that's actually not a good idea. It's not actually the right what you're trying to do. So I think we're going to have okay. a bit of time to chat about that afterwards, yeah. so we yeah. can just yeah. press on. So, so, uh, sorry. Go Shall on. we maybe introduce that we raise our hands if we want to say something, just to keep everything a bit yeah. calm? Yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to have a lot of discussion anyway. Ah. No, it's not. But um, well, we're going to split up, so we get more people talking. Okay, so, uh, so you've more or less covered this. This is all great, so I haven't really got anything more to say. But, in so much as I have, I've got down, like, so, make a list. Okay, that's sort of step number one. Step number two is to make different sorts of lists. So, as we've already identified, there's a sort of time span list that you can do that's sometimes called self ordering which is you can ask a big question like, where's my life going? And then you start making a list. Or below that, you might say, how are we going to solve the climate crisis and how I'm going to do it? You make a list. And then you might say, okay, I'm in Extinction Rebellion. How am I going to be most effective in it? Do you see what I mean? You can work that down. Um, so that's one way of doing it. The second thing is the notion of prioritisation. So what I've been doing for the last 20 years, I'm not saying this the right way, is every time I get up in the morning, I make a list. And then I go one, two, three, four, five. Because if, I've all got, if they're all there, I just put my head in a couple of cows I'm supposed to do. My brain's not very good. So once the, uh, that basically the, the list is then my dictator for the, for the day. I just go bum, 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 bum. Okay. So... The general principle here, as you've correctly identified, is urgent and important. And another way of putting that is first things first. So you identify every day or every week how long you're going to do it. Then another principle is delegation. So, which we're going to talk about a bit more in the next section, which is can I get someone else to do it? All right, this is the main thing in my life. <laughs> is how can you get someone else to do it on the assumption that someone else could do it? Okay. Now, something I've discovered in the last two or three years is a no this notion, which may sound a bit weird, it's a notion of not really having a strategy. And this is like higher level list making. It goes something like this. It's like most books traditionally in terms of this sort of thing, time management, have you, is to say like work out a strategy, you know, you're going to sort out climate change, boom, 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 right? And then there's this other school of thought that's come in, which is more based upon how people think and how systems work, which says that the problem with strategies is they're rigid. So there's this new idea, which I think is quite sexy, is that you keep changing your strategic orientation. So a classic example is with what we do in Rising Up, is we've got this plan, right? We're going to do this thing on, on the 31st, we're going to do this thing on the 17th. Then it all goes like bonkers because Mombio has written an article about it, and there's 10,000 million people want to go. And it's like, well, we don't just need to do a sit down in the road and go home again, right? Well, that's in the strategy, do you see what I mean? So the idea is to take continuous feedback from your environment and then re continually reassess your strategic orientation. So now we're going, okay, so maybe we're gonna sit down on the bridges for five days and we're humming and ahhing about that. And then we're going to look at capacity and if we've got enough capacity we're going to make that binary decision you see what I mean so you can do it yourself you see what I mean so you might be organizing in, in room or something you know and you think look we've got enough capacity for you know uh, a media group and you know an outreach group and then someone comes and that's your strategy and someone comes along who's you know brilliant uh, door knocking or something you know and you, and you think oh no no we're not doing door knocking until next month you see what I mean and if they say you need to change it, you go, okay, right, let's change that, let's go and do some door knocking. You see how many of these guys can do? You see what I'm trying to say? So, the book to read on this, which is a bit, which is about as cheesy as I'm going to get, is The Seven Habits of the Most of the most Effective People. I think that's what it's called, I can't remember all of this. Seven Habits of the Most Effective People. Is that Stephen? Um, Stephen, somebody over there. Yeah. So, this is fantastic American individualist. Evangelical Christian entrepreneurial get rich quick sort of book. So you're gonna have to like 
probably knows who I am reading at. Yeah, it's all the versions of it. So, and that basically uh, is a window into the these guys that spend all their lives trying to work out how to make money most effectively, most quickly, and keep their families together. Uh, and uh, that's what it does. So you just exact from it, you see what I mean? Uh, you don't need to buy the, the money back. Well, you might, but... Um, okay, so is there any quick questions on that? Well, habit number seven is keeping the score sharp. So you don't right. the, the previous point, which is that you, it's, it's useless trying to score if you're thinking that you can't score. Yeah, yeah I vaguely remember that one. Let <laughs> 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 you know that. Anyone knows more than I am as well. That's good. So you can just have a... Yeah. Um, to organise yourself to have downtime with family and friends as well, or to not just live in this bubble of stress and coordination. Yeah, absolutely. Time when you're not doing it. Yeah. In fact, I didn't mention that hinterland, as they call it in class politics. So, uh, yeah, what you want to be thinking about more in a more general sense is what crappy thing you do when you're not changing the world, and you need to have something. That you Embarrassingly non non activistic because that takes you out of yourself. Just like angry. Pardon? Angry. Angry, angry is like if you're in a bad state of mind, you anchor yourself to a positive state of mind yeah. so that you can go back into that instead of being in the moment of positivity. Yeah, fantastic. You just know all this stuff, I'm just going to go in a minute because you know all that's good. Okay, <laughs> so turn to the person next to you and one person tells the other person. A summary of these two main areas, right? And then the other person says back to them where they've got it wrong or where I've got it wrong. Uh, so that between the two of you, you've basically got that in, in your heads. Okay, so one person talks first. Alright, so first, now we're going to go on to the group level, okay? So the question now is you've got yourself sorted out. You've got your hinterland, you've transcended into enlightenment, you've, um, you've got your lists, you've got your lists for lists, um, and, and you know what to do when you get pissed off. Okay, so the next thing is you're going into a leads or crew or whatever, and you're going to organise the masses to rise up. So how are you going to do that? Uh, in, uh, in, in your town or city context. Okay, so we're going to split this into two sections again. One is how do you personally relate to people? So you might call this person management if you want to be like posh about it. So what are the tips? You know, um, how do you deal? How do you speak to people in order for them to get empowered? And how do you deal with people if they're a bit tricky? So you guys some little tips on that one and then you guys can think about more the system side of things I'm going to swap you around by the way but um, you know how do you organise what's your plan uh, to have 100 people in your town and city mobilised what sort of things do you have to do what, what's your plan how do you design it what's some general principles you see what I mean so again don't worry if it's a little, little bit vague uh, okay so, um, so turn to person next to you. One or two key key things that jump out. Okay, and that be the, the whole truth. Okay, yeah, you got that. So turn to person next to you. <coughs> Best to treat people and talk to people in order to uh, maintain relationships and build and build your thousand people in your local town striding down to London. As it were. So one or two ideas. Well, we can, we can uh, listening, you know, and uh, being, being kind of adaptable to the norms. And avoiding preaching to people in a kind of negative way, I guess, then, because you don't want to be there. Like, you need to make, you need to make people live, like, learn themselves in a way that just kind of shouting people. It yep. doesn't, it doesn't really help people. Like and, and actually, for me, it, this is important, it's not being impatient. Emergency. Yeah. There is. <laughs> yeah, but it's not like being impatient and sort of get on. Okay. Yeah. 
When we have these uh, things, by the way, don't comment anyone because it sort of clogs the whole thing up, but that's all right. You can talk to the person next to you about why it's not a great idea. Um, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Off you go. If we put trees in like they're already doing some kind of powering we to treat them like they're already powered and just keep them like they're already there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, one more um, idea. Um, the idea that you can make what you're saying and suggesting more accessible in a kind of, using humour, using, you know, jokes even, even though it's a very serious topic, people kind of shut up if you were going to come at them with an um, in-your-face, aggressive, angry, scared sort of line. So you kind of need to make it gentle and then ramp it up a bit. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I've got that in mind. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna, as you probably noticed by now, like this is a speed thing, right? So we're not like going into massive depth, it's more like I'm giving you a list and you can go away and research it a little bit more. So I'm just gonna pick out two issues here. As a little bit of a disclaimer, I'm actually very good with people. So, uh, <laughs> so I just want to say that before someone goes away and says, I don't know, and he's telling everyone else to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I've had to learn, this is one of my weak points, I mean, we've all got weak points, right? I just find it quite irritating a lot of the time. Uh, so I've had to work on it to actually be, be nice to people. I'm quite good at like designing my page when it comes to listening to someone who's quite irritating, it's quite true for me. But anyway. So I'm just going to tell you what the deal is, not what, that's not, you know, it's not necessarily what I'm good at. Okay, so one of the big deals is something called non-violent uh, communication. It's one of the main things in the literature. Non-violent communication basically means a way of talking to people that doesn't like, entrench your conflict with that. Okay, so again, there's lots of different variations on the theme, but it's like a key sentence which goes something like, when you do this, it makes me feel that, and I'd like you to do the other. And the other thing is something quite specific. So the key thing here is to not go around telling people what the situation is, but to speak in the first person, okay? So my view on this is this, rather than this needs to happen and you need to do it. Do you see what I mean? Which is a good recipe for pissing people off. So that opens up a dialogue where they can come back and say, well, I feel X, Y, and Z. And one of the biggest challenges of organising is dealing with difficult people. There's lots of difficult people in the world. And one of the ways of doing that is to, to use that framework. When you do this, I feel that, so you communicate how you feel about it. And what a lot of people forget is to ask for something concrete to come out of it, because that gives a way in which people can save face. So if you're saying you're really rubbish at writing emails, then it doesn't actually give that person a way out for their ego. Why do you say, I, I find that if you do this, you know, that would be better, and this is a new way of doing it. And they can say, oh, right, okay, I'll do it like that. So there's a whole number of variations on the theme, and you can look it up on the internet and learn some of them. Now, a little caveat is, is that, as we probably all know, people are very different. 
So some people respond to a particular approach and some people don't. So you'll find a lot of people very dogmatic on personal interactive management. They'll say, this is the way to do it. Well, it will be maybe for 60% of people, but 60%, 40% won't. So you don't muddle through, as you might say. Uh, and similarly with yourself, like a lot of people, I'm really nice, so I quite find it quite easy to be nice to people because that's who I am. But I do know people that are very effective, that are quite abrasive. So if you're sort of an abrasive sort of person, maybe you're going to get away with it. But on balance, it's not, it's a scary strategy, you see what I mean? So that's not to say you shouldn't get emotional with people every now and again. I do know activists who are very emotional with people and they are effective because they're basically putting through the bullshit, you see what I mean? But, so that's something to ponder, ponder a little bit, I guess. And the other two things which have been mentioned is it obviously helps a lot if you've got a sense of humour. So humour is absolutely central to empowerment, in my view, is because it basically releases tension. And when people, when people become tense, they don't want to do stuff. And when they relax, they do. So it be self-depreciating, like probably knows me do every time we get scared and go back and sort of say something about so. And the other thing is appreciation, which is massively underestimated, how effective appreciation is. Which is something we're really bad at doing. <laughs> but it's not something that all you guys can do. So what that means is when someone's done something, you ring them up and say, that was great. And that's so effective at empowering people because we love people saying nice things to us and we're all suckers for it. <laughs> uh, and don't deny it, right? Everyone loves it. So, uh, so the more you do that, then obviously it's got to be authentic. <coughs> but if someone's like, you really appreciate it, and that's the most effective person managers, you, you probably know people like this, people that are really good at getting people to do stuff, use loads of appreciation. I think there's some sort of rule that for every criticism there should be 10 plus points, to see what I mean, otherwise you're basically sending someone down the drain. I think you're doing very well here, I Pardon? I think you're doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> you're my man. <laughs> Yeah, food has got a hand. All right, I'm just, I'm just <coughs> Roger. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So what do you, I, I think, you know, it's all really cool stuff. So I'm sort of wondering, what do you do if you have hyper tricky people? So, you know, people, for example, who talk very much in a quite almost compulsive way, and it reaches that point where they are so disruptive in the meeting that other people can't talk anymore, and it gets to a point where it's even almost insulting because they interrupt other people. They don't yeah. really acknowledge that there's a person who's supposed to facilitate. I, I guess maybe that's also about, like generally in Rising Up, what, what, what's our approach? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to deal with that problem over the next two or three se se okay. sessions because it's one of the big taboos of organizing is we all, we're all nice people and we all like to think everyone's nice and we're all going to work together. The reality is that some people are a total nightmare and you have to deal with that. And, and activism does attract people that are total nightmare. Uh, so what do you do? <laughs> okay. All right. I've been total nightmare in a non-violent, uh, um, sort of breaking my own rules there. Someone that I find I have a problem with. Okay. All right. So um, I'm just going to say, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer that in a number of, I'll keep bringing it up, all right? Because I'm going to, obviously, non-violent direct, the non-violent communication method is one way of dealing with difficult people. Yeah, I feel that when you do this, I feel that, and I'd like to do something specific. So that's one little chink of your strategy. The next chink of your strategy in a group session is to, is to, um, is to set the ground rules at the beginning of a meeting. Okay, so I have spent like 10 years training people to do facilitation. And the key thing that I found in all my facilitation sort of stuff was the key thing to basically have a good meeting is to set the ground rules at the beginning. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to return to this being one or two times, is we're all like herd animals. Sounds a bit demeaning. But the upshot of it is, is if everyone's behaving themselves, then everyone behaves themselves. Do you see what I mean? And as a leader of the pack in inverted commas, it's subliminal that you are when you stand up. If you say, we're all going to respect each other, 
We're all going to give each time, each other time to speak, and we're all going to listen to each other because we all are here to work together. Something like that. Okay? And then you say it again. Never say something once. Say it again. Okay? And 80% of the time that's going to sort out the, the, the semi tricky people. I mean, super tricky people, it's not going to say. That's for 90% of the time I'm just talking about semi tricky people. I'm going to say a little bit about meetings. Uh, because I think this is, is helpful because all of you are going to organise face-to-face -face meetings particularly ones which involve people that aren't particularly involved in activism so I, I, some of my research is basically based on how to empower people in meetings so I'm just going to give you a little checklist I'm not going to really necessarily explain the ins and outs of it but this yeah, is kind of just are we going to listen to what next time? yeah, yeah, I'll do that in a sec okay. yeah. I thought that was what they were doing. Like, yeah, yeah, quite possibly. I mean, good point. I, I mean, this could separate between 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 the two. Okay. Um. Yeah. Don't know where it fits in, so I'm just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> meetings. Okay. <laughs> so the most effective way to have meetings is to do the following things. This is checklist. Okay. When people come into the room, someone should welcome them face to face. Okay. The worst thing is to have people come into a room, it's a bit like going to a party, you're in the corner with your glass of wine or whatever, thinking like really crap because no one's talking to you. Right? As soon as someone talks to you one to one, you get integrated. That's the first thing. Secondly, lead people ideally to a small ta to a table where people are facing each other. Okay? Because then they'll naturally start chatting to each other. Obviously in the lecture days it's a little bit tricky. So you should ideally have a flat room like this and have the chairs in little groups. So people come in, they get their cup of coffee, and then they sit down, they're facing someone, and 99% of the time they start chatting. And humans love to chat. So by the time the meeting started, they're already relaxed. You see what I mean? Um, the second thing is like at least 50% of the meeting, ideally, should be participatory. So what that means is you do a little bit of an input, and then and then you get people to talk about it, which is what we're doing today. Okay. Because, as I say, the act of speech is what empowers people, not listening to information. So, I'm going to emphasise this point over and over again. This information is not, is not going to create the revolution, right? What's going to create the revolution is the act of speech, i.e. people talking to each other about their reality, if you see what I mean. So, and we've all been sucked into this sort of academic, sort of rational information sort of Thing, you see what I mean? Where what we need to do is tell people well, what's going on, and suddenly they'll rise up. Not true, unfortunately. Wish it was. Um, <laughs> th thirdly, you must have food. So you invite people to bring food with them and drink because people love to eat. Okay, so it's subliminal. So we should all have some big picnic in the in the middle. Okay, or you have it on the table. Okay, and that relaxes people as well. So, um, Biscuits on the side. Yeah, whatever you like, really. Um, okay, and this isn't comprehensive, okay? And then ideally, everyone who who leaves the meeting gets phoned up afterwards. People like to be phoned up and say, Oh, I'm Jack, I think you were at the meeting, it's your first meeting, how did you get on? Okay? And the point of that is not to get information, the point of that is an act of of appreciation stroke human connectivity. Do you see what I mean? So it's not a lot of people say, well, what do you ask them? It doesn't really matter, right? The point is, is someone's phoning them up and it shows that you care and there's people in it. So basically the meeting is really a social setting and it has social dynamics. It's not primarily political. <laughs> this research in the United States shows that most people that go to a campaign meeting, sorry, 50% of people that go to a campaign meeting are not primarily interested in the issue. Sounds really dramatic, but it's in that ballpark. They may be there because they may ask them to go. Yeah? Strange but true. Okay? So it's one of the main things that activists get wrong is because all of us are probably nerdy activist types, right? We're up at four o'clock in the morning trying to work out how to sort out climate change. <laughs> Most, I can tell you now, 99% of the population does not wake up at four o'clock in the morning to think about climate change. What they think about is Am I a nice person? Do people like me? And am I in a group that makes me feel good? Okay? Those are the main things that people think about. Okay? 
okay? So you create an atmosphere where people are happy and they feel like they're valued and it's exciting and sexy and boom, 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 and it's going somewhere, then they're interested. Um, right, okay, so. Um, <coughs> We're going to take a little bit of information from these. Yep, yeah, one? sorry, I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, from you guys, we're looking at how you actually design your your mobilization the system in the room, whatever, which is going to get you all your people down to London. So, one or two ideas. So, quite obviously, my logic consists of quite easy parts. Say that again. I can't hear you very well. A plan, obviously, a plan. Um, but a plan is made of, of separate um, discrete parts. Uh, one like your communication plan, uh, one, two, your roles. Say that again. Your communications. So your plan is made up of a couple of different sessions. Communication yeah. one of them. Um, your role is going to be another one. I'll let other people talk. Oh. Okay, so this is a bit of a fuzzy sort of section, I guess, because we sort of we sort of sort of dealing with it. We'll, we'll deal with it a little bit in the next section, and also I've dealt with it a little bit on meetings. But I'm, I'm sort of approaching it. Which is, you know, there's ways of different. There's lots of different ways of putting this here. So <clears throat> I'm just going to make a few comments, right? Because obviously there's loads of experience in the room about the nitty gritty of basically organising in a city or something. Um, but the, the main thing I want to emphasise is the importance of delegation. So one of the main problems with activists is, and people that do things, is they do loads themselves because everyone else is rubbish. And uh, you know, I might as well just do that myself, right? We have all thought that, haven't we? So, so, and it's probably true because although this is a bit politically incorrect, a lot of people are not very good at doing things, and a few people are very good at doing things. <laughs> so, uh, how, do, how do you deal with that? So, I've, as I've learned to do it, is, is ruthlessly delegate. So ruthlessly de delegate means that even if they're gonna make a mess of it, you still get them to do it, because otherwise, you're gonna be dead, and burnt out, and overwhelmed, uh, or you're just going to be so self-righteous. 
that your brain and everyone else is rubbish. Because the general rule of thumb is people get better by making mistakes. Okay? And the greater you, the greater autonomy you can give people, although you're like biting your, your lip about it, the more they're gonna get things done. The second a second rule of thumb is is that a lot of people say, I tried to delegate that and it didn't work. Okay? I've probably done that. And that and that's why I'm doing it myself. Well that's because people are very different and you've got the right person. So you have to persist at delegating. So it's like, you know, you might say, oh, I've got a coordinator of the suburb of Leeds, and oh, the person hasn't got back to me for a fortnight, you know, I can't delegate that. Well, that's because you've got the wrong person. So you have to find the right person. So again, this goes back to sort of entrepreneurial stuff, which is what people don't like. It's basically called headhunting, right? So what we, for instance, when we started doing the talks around the country, getting a list of a load of people, and it's like, you've got this big list, right? But 80% of those people aren't really going to come to very much. And maybe like 15% of those people are fairly cool. But there might be one person who's super duper. So you want to spend 80% of your resources, time resources, bringing the super duper person on. Because a super duper person is worth 100 not very super duper. <laughs> and I know that sounds a little bit tricky, but that's, that's basically how things work, is, is there's people in this world who are doers and have got a good skill set. Now that also relates to the point you make, is people have different skill sets. So one of the reasons to delegate and bring people in to a coordination group is because I know you think you're great, but you're not great at everything. Okay, so you need to bring people in who are good at what you're not good at. Okay, so <coughs> you have to persist that. I can't emphasize this enough. And this is where your resilience comes in. You know, you come and say, It's a fourth person I've tried to get to delegate to do that, and it's failed. Well, you've just got to do it again and get the fifth person. There's no way around it. You want to organize people, you've got to get these people in, and you've got to be nice to them and appreciate them and all the rest of it. And then slowly it will start to develop. Sometimes you're going to be really unlucky, and sometimes you're going to get a break. And it's not personal, you know, it's chaos. The world is chaos. So you don't know what's going to happen. You know, so you can yeah, I have a question because um, I find that we can delegate things to people who are very competent in what they're doing, but the big thing that stops us from doing what we want to do is, is their commitments outside of that person. And now, when we're talking about um, mental health and making sure we're mentally well, uh, a problem I find is. People want to help, but they're also trying to keep themselves in check. So it often means the pool of people I have, or we have to, um, to do some work with, do some work on, and it shrinks radically because certain people either aren't competent or one of the other competent, and they're doing, they don't have the time to do it. So how do we get around this, this resource problem of always having available people to do the work? Well, all, all, obviously, like this whole number of different sorts of people with different sorts of availabilities. But the general rule of thumb is autonomy creates empowerment. So that's the main takeaway. So if someone's like, hasn't got very much time, is really unconfident, then it's the same principle applies. We obviously don't want to give that person some amazing, you know, great big job that they're just gonna feel shit about because they can't cope with it. Do you see what I mean? Well, if someone who's recently come and got some time, you can give that person a little bit more to. So that's like a judgment call, and sometimes you're gonna get it right, sometimes you're not. But the general principle is you have to ruthlessly give autonomy to people. And we're going to talk about that very often in a minute, because it's based upon this sort of research and so on. Uh, yeah, go on. Just a short one. Um, if you uh, repeatedly delegated someone that you trusted and they have uh, let you down for different reasons each time, how do you really manage that if they're part of the team? <laughs> <laughs> Say, <clears throat> You're, I can't really answer it. You're just going to use, have to use your judgment on it. You know, because it depends, doesn't it? Sometimes you're going to get it right, sometimes you're going to get it wrong. But you do need to make that decision that someone simply is not going to do it, right? So it's not like just delegate endlessly to someone that's completely rubbish, right? You're just going to have to say, okay, that person isn't going to do it. And sometimes you're going to have to deal with it. So coming back to the difficult person problem, Sometimes you're going to have to use non-binary communication to say, 
Joe, you know, you're a great guy and I really like you and you're really good at doing this, but well, I find that when you do that, it's a problem and I'd like you to do something different. And 50% of the time they're going to apologise and be fine, 50% of the time they're going to go, fuck you, and walk out the door. Because <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot control people's emotional maturity. You see what I mean? That's the world we're in. That's a great point. I was going to say, one thing that I'm going to say is accountability. Uh, and in, when you're doing men's work, it's so much a big deal being on accountability. Um, I'm just thinking about if, if somebody isn't doing the work and you, you know, but, uh, they're, they're fucking up in, in a way, but then I suppose you've got kind of personal relations. That's too much. Uh, I mean, I that's fair. Yeah. Um, you need some kind of uh, human resources communication where you point out, and I point out to that person that, um, that the job isn't being done. And um, you know, you said you do it, etc., etc. Doesn't get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, make them feel accountable and make them feel like you know they're on board. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just, could we? I'm asking. Could we have a plea break, stroke stretch break, stroke yeah. tea break, please? Yeah. yeah. Shall we oh, go for okay. another five minutes okay. on this? And that's going to have. We all get up and jump around. <coughs> I'm just going to finish on something that's um, a bit, a bit of a taboo subject, okay? But it's another major issue you're going to find when you organise, which is difficult political people. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do a little chart here. So usually, usually find like people, most of us in this room, is we're really political, but we're really practical, right? Because we want to get some things done, okay? And then. Below us in the first corner, there's another group of people that are really political and don't want to get things done because they're so political. Yeah. All right? <laughs> and, I'll, I'll, and we can separate those people out in a minute. And then below that, there's sort of, this is like times a thousand times bigger. Those are, those are, those, that's the 1% of the population that are shitting themselves about the political situation. They really want to do something, well, they're not actually that political, you see what I mean? And uh, this is probably the single biggest reason like movements get into a, a problem, is that these people really want to get stuff done, and they go down here to try and involve these people, and these people basically grind it to death, okay? <laughs> For very good reasons, which is going to make people, yeah. So when you say political, do you mean political? Okay, well, I'll give, you, I'll, give you the main, sort of, I'll give you the main tribes, right, right. that do this over the last 30 years, right, and you're going to squirm when I say it because I have all these people just for the, for the, for the issue, but so maybe this is maybe the most controversial thing to say, but there's, there's different political tribes in our society that want, want to basically get everything perfect before things happen. So, uh, so there's extreme veganism. The big is a big issue. Extreme hard left viewpoints. Extreme intersectionalism, which is, you know, we need to be all perfect and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's another one. The hard right. Yeah, in the Muslim houses of the UK. No, no, no hard what, left. What, what I mean here is that people will say you can't do that. You can't do that until that is sorted out. You see what I mean? And often they're right. So, for instance, like, like some vegans will say, you can't, we can't have a movement until we've made, I'm, I'm exaggerating, right? We can't have a movement until everyone is vegan in the movement. You see what I mean? Or some people will say, we can't have a movement until we make clear that capitalism has got to disappear on day one. I'm exaggerating. You see what I mean? yeah. Or they'll say, can't have a movement until we have diversity in some extreme sort of sense. Okay? So, and there's another one uh, anarchists. <laughs> so, we can't have a movement until we're all totally participatory. Okay? You know, we can't have that much hard selling for more than two minutes, that sort of thing. Okay? So, the serious point about this is that all these points of view are right, but all the most effective movements have a central concept, and that concept is balance. 
I balance the pragmatic need and the ethical imperative to change society versus the need to be eternally ethical, as you might say. Can you say that again, please? So the balance, the balance uh, sort of conundrum, as it were, is to be effective externally as a movement, because that's obviously a moral imperative. We need to get into London and close it down and change climate change versus being ethically consistent, okay? So you can see movements historically that go out of balance one way or the other, if you see what I mean. So for instance, you might have like the Leninist movement to basically say, right, we're gonna take down the state. And everyone has to do exactly what three men at the top say. So obviously that's the imbalance, if you see what I mean. Or on the other extreme, we have people saying, we're not gonna be able to move until you know, we've got everything sorted on making sure that everyone's vegan, let's say, for the sake of all. So I'm not certain to tell you where the balance is, but I think the mature orientation here is to understand that wherever you are, it's a mess. Do you see what I mean? Because real life is messy. And at some point, you're going to have to say to those, these people here, that yes, we've got this policy, and we've got that norm, and that's what we're doing, and it's not perfect because we're trying to change society. And most people are fine with that, but maybe 20% of people in this group will basically out, they will inadvertently destroy what you do because they're not actually interested in political effectiveness. They're interested in a pure approach which makes them feel good. And I'm not necessarily saying they're bad people, by the way, I'm just being sociological about it. So a strategy around this, a lot of people make a mistake of going, well, you might make this mistake of thinking, right, you're going to go back to Leeds or something, and you're going to have a meeting with all these groups, right, representatives of all these groups, and all these groups will be going, have you done that yet? Have you done that yet? And all the rest of it, and you'll get clogged. So the name of the game is to bypass these people, or at least recruit the little bit of them to get it, and go down here. And that's how you manage to mobilise like a thousand people in three months, yeah, by having a public meeting. And if the public meeting is constructed around participatory principles, you won't have the SWP guy standing up at the end. Everyone's feeling good, and he does a rant about how it has to be socialist, otherwise it's rubbish, right, which brings everyone down. This happens over and over again. And how you do that is you don't have a Q&A. Q&A is basically <laughs> encourage new people and absolutists. <laughs> Yeah, we all know this, right? I mean, you can have a Q and A if you're super confident, and yeah, and you're in a group of people that are generally like in the real world. But you can have a public meeting. Eighty percent of the people will be normal people, in their comments, who are basically interested in the issue, and twenty percent of people will be political absolutists, and they will be there basically to appropriate your energy. So. So there's two strategies. One is to go to the general public, you have a general meeting in your university, or you have a general meeting in your town. That brings in all these people who are going to be fab because they're going to be practical. And if you do have a meeting, then you use participatory design to design out people that want to talk you up. Um, and if you think about this for something I just brought out, my last final point is the most successful, and so the most successful progressive socialistic experiment in the world is the Mondragon Bond properties in Northern Spain, which involve about like half a million people in housing blocks and workers blocks, they have their own bank, basically where we all should be going if we're all sensible. And they built that over 40 years, the most amazing experiment, you can check it out. Can you say what it is again? Mondragon. Yeah, N-O-N, Dragon, I think, something like that. Yeah. Don't ask them to spell it in case I'm a strong um, and their central concept, the whole concept of that cooperative system is not socialism or, you know, you know, doing the bad guys. Their central concept is balance. Because in practical, in a practical, in terms of practically creating a better world, everything comes down to balance. Because you, you're, you've got these different, you've got competing logics. And you have to, like, you have to, like, find that and sometimes you're going to get it wrong. But as long as you know that's the game, that's the, that's the, that's the structure of the problem, then you're 80% there, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're not getting sucked into thinking one logic is more important than another logic. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so we're going to have a break of tea and <coughs> drinks, and everyone needs to get up because I don't want to sit down where you were. We've evolved in Extinction Rebellion. So, <coughs> so the, the good news is, is you sort of know how to do it. <laughs> Which is cool. Um, uh, so it's a matter of getting on with it. Uh, this is half battle. All right. So I'm going to do the sort of massive organising situation here. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just run through it, sort of regress into top-down communication. Sorry about that. It's getting pretty mean. It was great at the beginning, but you got really dictated fish at the end. Anyway, right. So. And then what, we'll, what I think we'll do is I'll just go through it. It's really exciting, and I think it's great. And, and then we can talk to each other and describe the points I'm making. Okay. And then we'll get it typed up here. Yeah? Get it typed up as we go along. Um, and then we'll have some break. Uh, no, after that, I'll make a few uh, an emotional call for action before one o'clock. <laughs> and then we can have lunch, and then we'll get on to the nitty gritty. I wonder if it's possible to have 40 minutes for lunch, so if you order some better food coming in. Uh, Sorry? Better food coming in, same word, but then pop back. It's great. Same thing you want. Frida's gone. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we're only going to finish in one, if that's okay. Yeah. Can we have 40 minutes for lunch, then? Is that yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. yeah let's, let's work on work on that. Um, I forgot to say on the previous section that two books to read, or two sources, are, there's a book called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. Now this is another nasty capitalist book, a fantastic read, very readable. It based, this guy did a PhD on, on how people are persuaded to do things, uh, from, you know, anyway, just read it, it's great. The Art of Persuasion? It's uh, The Psychology of Persuasion, it's a classic in the field. Yeah, there's variations on the theme, but he's, uh, he's a nice guy. Uh, anyway, read that. <coughs> the second thing you can read, which obviously is total self-promotion, is what I've written on Radical Think Tank. If you go onto the website, I've, I've done a paper on how to organise meetings and why they work, uh, which is my award-winning research. <laughs> so, uh, you, can, you can check that out. So, on the right people think tank? No, uh, mm -hmm. Radical Think Tank. Oh. You look on the internet and just download it. There's also a document on there on uh, how to win, uh, and that's, uh, that gives some of the, some of the ideas that we've been going through. Okay, sorry. Yeah. If you found yourself short of time, you couldn't dedicate to reading the whole book, would a summary of the book be if you could find it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, I think there's some people that are sharing information about all this. Someone could initiate that, because what we want is a resource, a resource file, don't we, of well, you should do it. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> great to do that with basically, you know, the, the educational resources. And obviously, I mean, there's loads of, there's loads of YouTube things. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to read the book, you just look on YouTube and someone's done a video of it, right? I find that the, the things you suggested as a pack of resources for busy people. Yeah. yeah. The stuff on the meeting is only about 10 pages or something, so that's reasonably straightforward. Um, okay. So, who's the author of the influence book? Actually, who's the author of the first book? I don't know, you just type it into Google, you'll find it. I don't know what the name is. Okay, so. So, the point, the point of what we're doing today is to try and make ourselves into generalists, right? And it's generalists that are going to change the world, not specialists. In other words, what we need to do is be really good at a whole load of different things. You've got to be able to be nice to people, you've got to be able to run meetings, you've got to be able to organise a locality, and in this last section, you have to really know how society changes, right? Because you can be shit hot at all this, but unless you're doing something that brings in the goods, it's just whatever, right? It's a personal exercise, right? So the good news is, is there's people that have been researching, not that many, because there's no money in it, researching how to bring about revolutions and rebellions successfully by doing historical research. 
Okay, so they're not sitting in a room getting all ideological. They're using social scientific methods to go around the world and say, what are the factors that bring about radical changes in society? Okay. So the book you want to read on this is called This is an Uprising. It's by two guys in the States, it came out two or three years ago. It's a good book because it gives you the history of people like doing their heads in and how the fuck we're going to change society and, and the debates over the last hundred years. Okay? And it goes a little bit like the following. It's basically two schools of four. So it's sort of fairly American centric, but you might say it's pretty broad. There's the community organising model and then there's a mass organising model. And they've both got really strong logics, right? The, the community organising model goes a bit like this, right? If you want people to get involved in stuff, you have to get down into the neighbourhoods and organise people one to one. So you have to leave them through the door, you have to knock on the door, you need to talk to them, you need to get them along to a meeting, you've got to phone them up afterwards. It's like grind, grind, grind. And there's the world is full of total heroes that do this like five nights a week, right? And they're the people that make the world semi decent, right? and they're all unsung heroes. Now, the pro one of the things that's good about that is you sort of know where you're at, right? So, for instance, if you read this book, there'll be these guys in Los Angeles, right? And they're all in the unions, and basically they have a demonstration and they mobilize by everyone phoning like people. And they know they're going to get 10,000 people in a demo because they know them all by name. <laughs> so many, it's amazing, isn't it? These Americans are fantastic, right? You know, this is what these organizers do year in, year out. Okay, so obviously that's good if it's really grounded. You know what I mean? People aren't sitting there. It's the opposite of sort of, you know, people sitting there talking about the revolution, not doing anything. Do you see what I mean? These are practical working class people. Blah, blah. Right, okay. So the big downside of that is you can get your 10,000 people in Los Angeles, you know, protesting about <coughs> casualization or whatever, and nothing happens. Because 10,000 people is not going to bring it about because it's a one day march, right? So then the other model is a mass organizing model, right? A mass organizing model is you have this big aim, right? The thing about the community organizing thing is you do it, it's a gradualist strategy. You know what I mean? It's like we want 10% pay increase. You know? The mass organising model is prophetic. So it has, we want black people to have their rights. You know, it's a big change. You know? We want to get rid of nuclear weapons. We want to make the world nuclear free. You know? We want carbon emissions to be zero by 2025, right? It's like, yeah, right. Do you know what I mean? So, how does that happen? So there's a different logic here, which goes something like this. If you give people a massive prophetic aim, then they're more likely to mobilize than we want, you know, a 10% pay increase, all right? Or maybe they don't, right? Because it's too unbelievable. So there's, this, there's two logics going on, do you see what I mean? For some people, you give them something little and they'll go for it and they'll give a little bit. But the other logic is, if you say something you did, then you inspire people. Now, 99% of the time, it fails, because there's always people making big demands, okay? But when social conditions become quite stressed, what happens is you have this whirlwind effect, which is every, you capture people's imagination, which is arguably what's happening now, which is why, you know, the most exciting thing I've done in 30 years, because you can sense that people are shitting themselves about climate change, because things get to that point, do you see what I mean? So you can see this in Global South with dictatorships, you know, everyone's going, you know, oh, you know, we've got gradualist strategies, you know, maybe if we're nice to the police, you know, they'll look after a bit more. But gradually, like, the dictatorship becomes more and more extreme, and people get to torture it. And then suddenly, because someone says, let's have a revolution, and it's like, nine times out of ten, they just get knocked on the head. It's not, but but the, the tenth time out of ten, it's like everyone, a critical mass of people go, fuck it, I'm doing it. You see what I mean? And then it's trapped and then it goes whoosh, and no one can believe it because it hasn't happened. So we all have experience of this if you if you were around in 2012 or whatever with the really Paris Spring. So there's people that have studied this, and the same thing happened in 1989. 
And what happens is people go, all the analysts are going, never, never, never. And when it happens, they're all going, we can't believe that. Because they don't understand what's called nonlinear dynamics, which is that once something's quite extreme, it's like a rubber band, you know, it takes a certain point and it goes boom. But you never can predict, predict absolutely where it's, where it's going to go boom, right? But what you can say absolutely at the same time is it will at some point. So you've got to hold those two logics in tension, do you see what I mean? You can't predict it and it's going to happen, right? Because most people confuse the two, you see what I mean? So we can say with absolute inevitability it's going to be rebellion around the world because we've got a global dictatorship sending us to our death. So you can absolute guarantee there's going to be social disruption in the next 10 years. But we don't know when. So we're having a stab at creating it now, do you see what I mean? Which would be great because the sooner you get on with it, the less tricky it's going to be. Okay, <coughs> so, um, so bringing it down to the, the situation at the moment, what we have potentially here, maybe we've got a 20% chance of it happening, is we've been doing the community organising model, which is going around the country doing these talks, right? And you get like 10 people to say yes, and two of them turn up to the meeting, and you delegate to one of them, and they don't show up, and you have to do the meeting again, and you get another one, and it's grind, and you're gradually getting there, blah, blah, blah. So that's the community organising model. And then what's happened is, uh, 10 days ago, when it was a fortnight ago, George Monbiot puts this thing into The Guardian, and suddenly it's rushed, get 1,500 likes in four days on the Facebook page. And it's like, Ooh. So what these people, in, this is an uprising, I say, they're trying to synergize these two approaches. Do you see what I mean? They're not saying, because there's loads of donkeys out there, you know, there's the mass organizing people and there's the community organizing people, and they've got really persuasive logic. It's like you find in lots of debates, you know, it's not like people are wrong, it's just they're not looking at the whole picture, yeah? So, what they're saying is, this is how, how you do. You have to start off with community organising, otherwise you've got nothing, right? But what you have to do is reach out to the people that are going to make it into a bit of a whirlwind, do you see what I mean? So, I'm like, you know, me and Robin have been doing the, you know, boring back of the back office stuff, of going, right, we're going to have a, you know, a, a workshop in, in Stroud, we're going to have one in Sheffield. And then, like, Gail, who's like, all these connections with the elites. <laughs> She's on the phone going, George, how about an article? Do you see what I mean? So it's a bit like, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a sort of, you know, you, it's inter interactive. So you build up a bit of momentum. <coughs> you call George Romeo, he says, well, maybe, because he don't want to do a, an article about anything, because he's going to lose his credibility. And then you build up a little bit more, and you phone in again, and at some point you get that tip, and then George Romeo writes an article, and then there's someone else at the time that's going, George wrote an article, I'll write an article. Mm -hmm. And then it goes non-linear. So, <coughs> um, so what, what does that mean, okay? So that's the mobilization side of it. And we all, you know, it's been loads of mobilizations, you know, I've asked them to bring a million people onto the streets of, of capitals, okay? But, why aren't they successful? Okay, so this is probably one of the most important points that we make here is fundamental change against entrenched interests. So there's a specific definition of the situation. Only happens when there's mass economic disruption. Okay, so that's like 101 sociology of revolution. Okay, nothing happens significantly until there's economic disruption, okay? So you can see this in a small scale in a labour situation, that, you know, the, the union representatives will go and talk to the bosses and say, look, you know, it's really terrible, and the bosses say, yes, you know, very good, see you again, okay? And then they go out and strike. Now, the thing to understand about strikes, that I was talking to someone, is on day one of the strike, no one's really bothered, right? So if you've got a scale of, say, one to 100, of economic disruption. On day one, let's say it's on five, right? On day two, let's say it's on seven. On day three, it's going to be, say, 13. On day four, it's going to be 40. And on day five, it's going to be 98. Why is that? Because economic disruption is non-linear, right? The longer, if you're a business person, like I've been in business, right? You 
you can phone someone up and say, I'm going to send that package tomorrow, and they go, yeah, OK. But if you've left it four days, you're going to lose the contract, do you see what I mean? So the economic cost is, goes, goes up like that. So the holy grail of, 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 of um, change, regime change or regime transformation, is what I'm calling the civil resistance model. And this is what's been used in the global south for 50, 60 times over the last 100 years. And it goes like this. It's really very straightforward. You get a critical mass of people who go to the capital city and they sit down and block the squares in the roads and they stay there. And don't like quote me on this as an absolute thing, but from my research, and you can look at the literature yourself, usually between five and 15 days, the regime comes to the table for fundamental political change or the regime collapses. Okay? Now, why does that happen? Partially because of the economic disruption, okay? And partially because you're putting the opposition into the mother of all dilemma actions, right? So in the literature, dilemma action basically means you break the rules and you put the opposition into a dilemma about how to react. Either they let you get away with it or they repress you. And the reason it's a dilemma is they've lost whichever way they act. So if they let you get away with it, so if I go to Spray York King's College, they can let me get away with it, but then they're thinking, well, what's all the people are going to do it, right? But if they depress me, and it's like, expel me, which they try to do for 10 days, then everyone finds out about it, and everyone goes, that's crap, and the more people are mobilised, okay? So it can happen on a sort of, you know, polite English level, as you might say, at like King's College, or it can happen on an Egyptian level, where people go out and they get shot, and then people go, fuck that, I'm going into Tahrir Square because I've had enough, you see what I mean? So in the literature, what's quite interesting is how bad the regime is, and what people don't get is, how bad the regime is, is no indicator <coughs> of how successful a rebellion will be. Because you can see there's two competing logics, do you see what I mean? So arguably, the worse a regime is, the more likely it's going to be brought down. Do you see the logic? because people will go into the square and they will be repressed and there's what's called this backfiring effect and more people will come in because of the extreme emotionality of the violence, you see what I mean? So you can see this sort of logic working out with the British elites, with the fracking situation. You know, what the, you know, there's always civil disobedience happening on fracking and it's like everyone's like, you know, just giving conditional discharges and then they flip which is what Gandhi said, yeah, first they ignore you and then they fight you. So there's this flipping, and then that judge suddenly decided, ha ha ha, I had enough of these nonsense, I'm going to put these people down for 18 months, right? And then there's a backfiring effect, which is suddenly, everyone knows about them. I know everyone's talking about more significant minority of the country are, this in the national press. And then it goes to appeal, and the judge goes, ha ha ha, we're making losses out of these people, you see what I mean? Better get them back out of prison. So you can see what happens is the elite gets split. So for, for instance, like King's College, when we spray chalk the central hall, we caused 10,000 pounds of damage, like they didn't know how to react to us, right? And I know, because I did research on it, so I went around all the managers afterwards, and they're going, everyone's like in chaos, because half the people are going, there's terrible people, you know, let's get them into prison, you know, we need to make us an example. And the other half are going, hang on, that's going to look, make King's College look really bad. Yeah, so we, we need to negotiate with these people. And you'd be reasonable, and they seem to be reasonable, so maybe we can come to a resolution. And those are the guys that won. You see what I mean? But we probably won anyway, because if they expelled us, then you know, that would be a big deal. Okay, so that's the dilemma action element of it. Right? The backfiring element is one of the main ways in which it works, and the civil resistance model basically means you have to cause that disruption continually, continuously, day after day. Um, I'm going to give you one or two other major dynamics, uh, and then you can talk to each other about it. Um, so another variation on the theme is the jail scenario, which which is another sort of tactic, as you might say. 
which uses the same dynamics. Okay, so one, one I'd say like the major dynamic is that economic disruption. The other major dynamic is sacrifice. Okay, so which is what Martin Luther King used and Gandhi used. And it goes like this: is if you get people arrested and the people are hurt and the people go to prison or variations on all three, then it creates a political drama. And a political drama is what the media is interested in, and the media will follow that. People will read about it, and the psychology goes something like this. I really don't like these people, but I respect them because they're willing to suffer for their cause. Okay, so it's a deep transcultural psychological mechanism, right? And another dynamic is that person is in my cultural, political, social group. They're suffering, and I need to go and help them because I am emotionally connected with them. Okay? So there's two dynamics basically create non-linear mobilizations. You see what I mean? So if you see this film Selma, you know, Martin Luther King, they're all going across this bridge, the, the bad guys go and charge them, and people are like beaten and all the rest of it's really terrible. But they maintain their non-white discipline and people have got enormous respect. And they're also enormously horrified by what happens. So two weeks later, they come across the bridge again with all the big wigs, okay, of, of the of the American society and all these Greek Orthodox archbishops. <laughs> <laughs> They're all there. And then bad guys are going, <clears throat> what do we do now? Do you see what I mean? So you've got them on the run. So arguably, this is happening now because the Archbishop of Canterbury phones up and says, yeah, I'll sign a letter saying we need a rebellion. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Because, and then those who go, people are going to go, whoo, you know, that's interesting. Maybe if Archbishop so and so, he thinks it's cool, then we do as well. Do you see what I mean? So the next step is the Archbishop of Canterbury comes down and gets arrested. <laughs> you see what I mean? And then he goes to prison. Okay? And once he's gone to prison, that's it. Game over for the regime. I'm not exaggerating, right? This is non linearity. It happens not very often, but it consistently happens. And it happens very fast. <clears throat> Non linearity. In other words, like, you know, um, exponential? Yeah, exponential. I'll, I'll give you the best example in the literature. So I'm going to ramble on a little bit. But I think it's great. So I'm just bear with me. It's what I'm enthusiastic about. So in 1989, this is followed in a lot of detail, there was a priest in, in Leipzig, is it Leipzig? Leipzig. Leipzig, Leipzig. Leipzig sorry. I'm not sure he's a specialist. Okay, he decided he had enough, the whole police state, you know, spies, people in jail, you know, totalitarian communism, blah, blah. So he goes out with his flock, and there's 80 of them, and obviously he's really mad, <laughs> because mad people's got more than anything, it's like really mad people. Okay, and they go, right, we've just had enough, we're just doing it anyway. So he marches out to the centre of the square, and I'm in a caricature in here, okay, and, and there's 80 people following because they trust him. Okay, well, we're going to do it as well. And I hate them speaking, what total lunatics, because they're all going to be arrested. That would be the end of them. And the chief police sort of looks at them and goes, you know, whatever, I just let them get in with that. And then the following week, because nothing happened to them, it was like something like, you know, 400, making these numbers up because it's not many. Okay? And the chief police in Leipzig said, oh my God, you know, this is growing. You know, and because it's a top down system, because all elite systems are top down, right? You can't act. So he has to phone up Berlin. So he phones up Berlin and goes, ah, there's 400 people, you know, this is tricky. Tell me what to do, you know. And then he had to go around the Communist Party bureaucracy. So like next week there's a few more. Anyway, the, the message comes back to the police chief, go and shoot them all. And he's going, all right, okay. So, but he, but then he marches out to the following Sunday. But the problem is the following Sunday is 5,000, right? Because before there was 80, now it's 300, now it's 1,000, now it's 5,000. And he's going, I can't do it. I just can't bring myself to do it. So he doesn't do it, okay? That's the tipping point. Because the following week, the fear has gone, right? And there's like 50,000. I'm not exaggerating, but it's something like that, right? And a week later, the regime collapsed, okay? Because the fear had gone. You see what I mean? They've lost the control of it. And if you look at the Arrow Spring on some of the revolutions, you get to that tipping point, right? And it rushes off. Well, on other 
uprisings like the one in Algeria, they only got like 500 people, and they all got nobbled, you know, unpleasant things happened. And then it went back down again, you see what I mean? So there's always, I don't know, paper, but, you know, you've got to get to this thing and then it takes off. So, without sounding too pressurising, we've got until the 17th of November to get to the critical mass of getting a thousand people into that square. So that's my, going against my head estimate. I mean, maybe it's 3,000, maybe it's 500, right? But if it's only 200, it's Algeria, do you know what I mean? If you want to go to Tahrir Square, it's 1,000, someone said yesterday, 3,000. Because what we can do then is continue it into extra days, do you see what I mean? Bush. So maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, but we'll have one stab of it on November and then we'll have an international stab of it in, in, in April. Um, so, um, okay, two, two other little dynamics before I finish. So we've covered this a little bit, but so I'll just reiterate it. There's another reason it works, which is if you have a big demand then you get a big commitment, okay? So you're here today, ready to dedicate your life to the cause, because we're not talking about picking up litter in the nearby park, right? You know, what we're doing is, this is a massive existential issue, this is time, it's a crisis, right? So, and the second thing we've got, which is why it's not Friends of the Earth, as it were, is we're actually calling for something that's big, and the reason you're attracted to it is because it's credible, because it is big, right? Because when Friends of the Earth sends out a little email saying, we've got a climate crisis, can you send an email please to the Prime Minister? <laughs> you're going, what the fuck, right? Really, are you insulting me? Because you know, and they know, and everyone knows, it's not gonna bring in the bacon. To be slightly better about it. You see what I mean? So, this happened in the Saunders campaign. So the whole logic of the last 30 years, as we all know, is small ass, small commitment. You, know? you can't ask big things because it will set people and people don't think it's credible, right? And then you get it split. So the whole democratic ethos is we can just, you know, mess around a little bit, make people a little bit less poor, make people a little bit less humiliated, okay? Bernie Sanders comes along, political revolution. Political revolution, political revolution, right? Everyone <coughs> goes, according to the theory, someone got a bit of water for me, please. <coughs> according to the theory, everyone should go, <laughs> no way. You see what I mean? But it didn't happen because of the particular condition. <laughs> so you can note down rules for revolutionaries, which is probably a very important, it's all right, cool. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so this is the main activist that got the sword in space. So that's the other thing. That's why, you know, when we talk to conventional activists and they go, don't say, don't say rebellion, what you know, it sounds good now. Do you see what I mean? Because they're in the democratic party ethos, which is small ass, small game. Yeah? So, um, and the last thing to reiterate is the emotion, not the information. Okay? This is the other major factor, as it were, or the embodiment of the shit. So the people that are going to lead this rebellion are going to be young people, 14, 15 year olds, and 84 year olds, right? Because they are the people that are going to be authentic and different, if you see what I mean? And they're going to, they're going to create the emotional response, right? Oh my God, a 14 year old is in tears, right? On television about what's happening. Oh my God, an 84 year old says he's gonna to go to prison. Do you see what I mean? So all those like young, you know, rear aisle, 22 year old blokes, no disrespect, they're out, right? You're doing, you're doing the social media. The heroes, and this is the same in all social, in civil resistance movements, it's women and grandmothers and old people and young people, they're the people that lead it. Because you wouldn't be screaming and crying anyway, you'd just be in behind doors, right? So you need to get out and do it. And you cannot exaggerate the effectiveness of that <coughs> not really necessary deep for that reason. I think part of the reason for that is the fact that our media is just so homogenous and the same tone for everything. We mm. talk about the sports and you know, whether or not everybody is thinking in the same voice. And we're just desensitised. So when someone comes at you with emotions, it really has an effect. Absolutely.
Absolutely, yeah. You can see the logic, right? If you go to a conventional PR sort of press briefing, right, you'll get the neoliberal logic, which is don't ask for too much because you won't get it. Don't be too emotional because you'll put people off and look unprofessional, right? It's a really powerful logic because it's got a lot going for it, right? But when you have a paradigm shift between a reformist like social space and a revolutionary social space, you have this complete, the logic collapses and the new logic takes its place. And there's always a lag effect, right? Because everyone's thinking, oh, I don't want to get emotional because no one else is, right? <laughs> do you see what I mean? So it's called cultural lag. So it was rational to do this like 10 years ago, right? But everyone's been going, mm, don't want to do that because, you know, Ruby says so professionally, do loads of quotes, do you see what I mean? So no one's done it, apart from Russell Brand, right? So you watch his video, that's another thing for everyone to do. Newsnight video, 10 million views. Why? Because he touches the guy's knee. Okay? <laughs> when did people last touch the guy's knee on Newsnight? Never. Okay, you can't underestimate. Okay, so when we get in front of Newsnight, we're going to hug the presenter, aren't we? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Okay, you get it? So <coughs> think about something embodied, <coughs> emotional. <coughs> Alright, so. We've got five minutes. I'll do my little emotional finale. <coughs> okay, this is off agenda, right? This is just some Roger Hallam routine, and then I'll shut up because I don't have much then. And then give the chat stuff. Well, I've been doing this research right for three years, five years, and I spent most of my life thinking about it anyway, which is, doesn't say I know what people did, but I've just been looking at it for quite a long time. And it goes something like this. I went down to London, you know, and I was thinking, there's all this shit happening, so there are probably loads of young people, you know, <coughs> hundreds of them every weekend protesting, and there's fuck all happening, and I'm just going, well, you know, what's going on, you know? And then I start talking to people uh, uh, and saying, it, you know, talk to quite a lot of people and they go, right, so why don't you go to prison? And they go, no, 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 I can't do that, I can't do that. And I'm sort of going, well, why not? Sort of thing, but it's a bit embarrassing, so keep, keep quiet about it. So over the last three years, myself and other actors have been trying to be promoting this literature, been trying to create what you might call a culture change in activism in Britain to bring it from what you might call it no disrespect intended, but an immature phase to a mature phase. You see what I mean? So the immature phase or the primary phase is when everyone's trying to be nice, everyone's playing by the rules, and everyone's like thinking that neoliberal logic, you know, NGO logic. And what we've been trying to do is say, hey, there was a world before 1989, and before that there was this thing called political struggle. And political struggle means people have to sacrifice. You know, they lose their jobs, they split with their partner, and that's what's needed now. Okay? Uh, and obviously, this is a very difficult message because I've had 30 years of thinking the politics is over there, and this is my life. And we have what I call like a consumer product attitude towards activism, which is here's my life, and I'm going to do a rising up thing, a bit like buying a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of it, we're going to assess whether it made us happy or not. Okay? And we're going to go, I did a rising up thing, it was okay, but it wasn't that great, you know, this is okay, but I'm not going to buy it again, okay? So what we're looking at, you can see the paradigm shift where the act, the, act, the act of resistance is central to who we are and our relationship with our partners and our job and our social respectability is on the outside. That's the flipping effect, you see what I mean? Which is super scary to say, it, right? Because no one really sticks around it, you know, the phone of all these people that want to go to prison and it's like, I can't do that on holiday. And obviously being a nice middle class person, I go, well, no worries, think about it in April, right? <laughs> it's not me because I've been in sales all my life. The last thing you do is want to accept people. But you can see like there's other people who are going, I was going on holiday, but I'm not going to do that now. Yeah. But we're still in this like polite paradigm where someone says, I'm going on a holiday and everyone goes, Yes, yeah, I understand that. You see what I mean? Because we're all pretending that, you know, that, that we, you know, shouldn't have to cancel your holiday. For God's sake, to save the world. You see what I mean? So, what I, the research I'm sort of doing, and for 
what I try to investigate now is this notion of fearlessness. Because I come to the personal conclusion that when the fear is gone, the regime collapses, right? So although I've said, although I've said like it's economic disruption, that's one sort of way, but behind the economic disruption is fearlessness. I, we're willing to go onto those bridges in London and all hell will break loose, let me tell you, it will, right? And, and 70% of the nation will hate you, just like they hated Martin Luther King in 1961, right? And what's going to get you through it is fearlessness of saying, I don't care what's happening to me because I'm done. I'm done with this and I'm going to do it. So I'm hoping for like moderate fearlessness, which I find too dramatic, but I go to Crown Court. And when the judge says to me, I can't talk to the jury about climate change, I'm not going to be deferential and find out what he's called and say, John Smith, I will wind up in there, and say, you're wrong, right? I want to talk to the jury about climate change and I'm going to carry on and I'm going to practice it to the, to the extent I'm fearless in doing it. And I'm going to say to the judge, you can do whatever you like to me. You can put me in jail for a hundred years. You can cut me into a hundred pieces because I'm done. You see what I mean? I'm done. You know, I've been an organic grower for 20 years. I know what shit's coming down the road. Now, it's over. You see what I mean? And that will be powerful. You know, because I'm not afraid of it. You see what I mean? And they'll drag me out of court and I'll shout, let's have a rebellion! <laughs> <laughs> and the irony is, it's so exciting once you've <laughs> gone to the other side. Because when you're fearless, you're not afraid anymore. Yeah? And so it's this other side. So we're all, I'm not saying like that all the time, okay? I'm just human, like half the time, I'm totally shit myself about it, right? But what I'm trying to say is it's like a muscle, right? So it's a spiritual muscle. And you can, we all know this in our lives, you can run away from fear or you can go into it. And the main point of life, as far as I can see, is to develop that muscle because it prepares you for death. You know, because at some point you're going to be on your deathbed. And that's going to be the biggest, scary thing in our lives, right? So you might as well get on with it. And so all those things where you've got those fear barriers, the name of the game is to push it and keep pushing it. And you can do that for two or three years, you turn into a pretty amazing person. You see what I mean? Because you're so powerful. And the literature shows that you just need 20, 30, 40 people who are fearless and can bring down the regime because they don't care what's going to happen to them. So this is us. We're on that front line. People will follow us because people love the people that are fearless. You see what I mean? Um, so I'll just finish like by saying like I used to be really fearful, right? Because I'm a really nice person, I hate the same people. So I'm a really overbearing man. <laughs> <laughs> If you think I'm some sort of hero, forget it, right? I'm just like super scared of upsetting people. So it's taken me like two years to get to a place where I can sit down in a row without shaking, right? Because I hate it. But now it's like, oh, you know, I'm seeing Joe this afternoon, oh, at 10 o'clock in the row. You see what I mean? Oh, I'm in court at 12, so I've got something else at 3. Don't really think about it anymore because I've socialised myself into it. You see what I mean? So you might think, oh, wow, I'm not bad. Go and sit in the road at 10 o'clock and I'm telling you. Um, yeah, so, um, what was I saying? Okay, just going to say my last bit. The other thing I want to encourage people to do there is to basically make major life changes. And when I was 20, I was involved in the peace movement. And I, I've been involved in the peace movement since I was 15. And <clears throat> I went to the London School of Economics. And after the first year, I dropped out because it was a lot of people of that generation who thought they were all going to be dead in five years. It's quite, you probably can't believe that was the case, but that was, a, that was the atmosphere in 1984. And from 15 to 20, I was shitting myself because I was thinking, what's the point? What's the point? And, and I left after the first year, quite brave, so I had this nice career and everything. And I thought, no, 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 I'm, going to do, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to work full time in the peace movement and so I left and I got rest about 10 times a year I went to 
to prison break for the time. And I had the time of my life. Because <laughs> I was with my mates. And we were just fearless. You know, in 20, we were just going, wait, we're going to prison. You know, in prison, you know. And you can see this in the children's march video. Put that down, children's march video. Have a look at it. So, children's march. This is what happened during 1916. Loads of kids came out of school. <coughs> so, obviously, that's your call. What you're going to do and what you're not going to do. But what you do need to know is that beyond that terror of losing your entitlements is the golden land of fearlessness. <laughs> this might not be in there all the time, but this, this major archetype in all human societies is the fear has to go out. You know, St. George goes out and slays the dragon. It's a universal archetype. So we're just replicating. What humans have had to do you know, for the last 20,000 years. This is just the latest chapter, and this is going to be the most glorious chapter because <laughs> it's the biggest thing ever. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.